Faith, hope, and love. Welcome, lovers of God. You are the best. The craziest story Jesus ever told, the craziest thing Jesus ever said. Three Bible studies. This is the third one. And today, this one is alarming because it is like smelling salts that kind of wakes us up from sleepwalking through life. It's very jarring. And this is the third, and it contradicts everything that our culture teaches you about your life. I'm Alan Hunt. I am your guide into the deep mysteries, the rich beauty, and the life-changing power and inspiration of Scripture. Every time you study Scripture, you grow one step closer to God. This is good stuff in this uh, third story that Jesus told that we're going to jump into. I'm glad you're here, whether you're watching live or whether you're watching on the replay. Um, let's just jump right in. Uh, I have a friend. She manages money for a living. She's a financial advisor. And what she tells me that she does is she says, other people give me their money and then I take care of it. I invest it and I produce a return for them. So I give her a thousand dollars out of my pension account. She decides how to invest it, stocks, bonds, real estate, um, options, T-bills, whatever. She tries to grow it and protect it. And she wouldn't want to lose it because she's a professional. It's my money. She understands that she cares for it. It's my money. She doesn't own it. I own it. She takes care of it. My money. She manages it. And that's the point of what we're getting ready to jump into. It's a really simple principle, but it's a life-changing, radical principle when you dive into scripture with this. Uh, this, is, this is basic idea that the manager takes care of the investment. He or she doesn't own it. It belongs to the owner. It belongs to the investor, not to the manager. Pretty simple, really. But we tend to make a, a bit of a mess out of that. So this is crazy story number three. It comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. You may be familiar with this one, maybe not. Let's take a look at it. Here it comes um, straight out of the gospel. This is Jesus talking. For it will be as when a man going on a journey called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them. And he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I've made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you didn't sow and gathering where you didn't winnow. So I was afraid. And I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I haven't sowed and gather where I haven't winnowed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. Their men will weep and gnash their teeth. Wow, now that's a powerful, powerful story. It's a jarring one. And so it, this is a story, this is a parable about money. Right now, a lot of times people want to get confused because it describes a talent. Well, a talent was a, was a, it was like a dollar. It was like a, you know, it, it was a point of currency. But a talent, I mean, look at this. A talent then was worth 15 years wages if you were a laborer. You worked in the steel mill, you worked in the fields, whatever your job is, whatever your job was then, 15 years wages as a laborer. So one talent was equal to about $750,000. Boom. So in this, in this parable, Jesus says there's a, there's a landowner who or a, or a business owner who goes away and he gives some talents to each of his 
or, or to, to three of his slaves. Now, it wasn't uncommon then for a slave to have responsibility, for a slave to be able to take command of households, be able to um, do business deals on behalf of his, his or her um, lord or his or her master. And so not, a, not an unusual story, except for gives one five talents. Five talents, five times $750,000 is 3.75 million bucks. We're talking some serious some serious cash here. Gives to one, 3.75 million dollars. Gives to the next one, two talents. So 750,000 times two equals 1.5 million. And then to the third slave, he gives one talent, $750,000. 15 years wages. So you can imagine, they're, they're, I mean, first of all, this is this is a very wealthy business person very wealthy owner. And second of all, there's there's some expectations going with this. I'm giving you 3.75 million bucks. I expect you to, to do something with that. I expect you to have a return. I'm giving you one and a half million. I'm giving you $750,000. I mean, that's more than almost any of us will ever see in our lifetimes or in our pension accounts. And he's doling it out just for this journey, go and produce a return. So first and foremost, understand this is a parable. This is a story about money. Now we like to expand it into different kinds of areas. And I get that. But understand first and foremost that talent was a currency. It, it was a term for one denomination of money. A big chunk is like a million dollar bill, a $750,000 piece of paper. Right? So this is a parable about money first and foremost. But here's the second thing that I want you to hear uh, is that God has invested in you. Right. So the first principle is that the owner owns the property the manager manages the property. The second is that God has invested in you. God has invested in you. And God expects a return. That's why this is such a jarring parable. Is like most of us are just kind of sleepwalking through life. We're trying to get the bill paid. I, I gotta get, I gotta call the cable company tomorrow because I got an internet problem. Um, my, my wife and I are struggling a little bit with this. Uh, my kids struggling with that. I'm trying to get this degree and I can't pass this class. I don't really like my job. Uh, my brother's got an addiction issue. We've just got all this stuff that, and we're just kind of sleepwalking through life a little bit numbly. And all of a sudden we read this parable, we read this crazy story that Jesus tells us. And it's like being in the in the corner of the ring in a boxing match, and somebody puts smelling salts under your nostrils. You woo! What you I mean? God has invested in me, and God expects a return. Yeah, that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. So, in some ways, this is not only jarring; it's a little bit heavy, isn't it? Because then you begin to realize, okay, I, I don't own; I merely manage what God has given me. So, God has invested in you. I mean, think about the different ways God has invested in you. Number one, He's invested time in you. He has given you a lifetime. Some of us will get 80 years. Some of us might get 90 years. You might get 100 years. You might get super bonus time. And maybe you get less than that. But let's just say that God gives you 80 years of your life. It's about the average lifespan. That would be about 29,200 days of life that God gives you. Now, that's a gift. I'm giving you 29,200 days, God says. What are you going to do with those? Wow. Okay. That puts my, my lifespan in a little bit different perspective. Second of all, God gives you relationships. He invests the people around you, your best friend, your lover, your spouse, your confidant, uh, your small group leader, your, your child, your coworker, the people around you, your family members, your coworkers, your neighbors, the people that you come in contact with at the grocery store and the hardware store. Those are relationships that God has placed into your life. And some of you are really gifted. Your life is filled with all kinds of wonderful people. And some of you may be a little less so. You only have a handful of people that God has placed in your life. But nevertheless, the people in your life are there because God has invested in you. He's given you time, 29,200 days on average. And he's given you relationships, the people around you. Next, God has also given you abilities, right? By some miracle, maybe you can play the piano or maybe you're really skilled at math or maybe you're really good at mechanics or maybe you got a really good financial mind like the woman I was describing at the beginning who manages people's money. Maybe you're just really insightful, you're really wise, but God has given you abilities. And God has given you unique abilities. You have, maybe you have special ones that almost nobody else has, or maybe you have ones that are fairly common, but you, God has given you those for a reason, because he's invested in you. He's given you 29,200 days, he's given you the people around you, and he's given you certain abilities. When, when I think about being gifted with abilities, I, I think about a woman named Evelyn Glenny. She was the first solo drummer or percussionist 
uh, to achieve worldwide popularity. She played with an orchestra in, in, in Indonesia. She played with a band in Brazil. She played with the New York Philharmonic. She's composed music for car commercials, for television shows, for feature films. She plays a whole range of instruments from the timpani to xylophone to the marimba. Uh, she's invented her own kinds of drums from exhaust pipes and children's toys. And did I mention, by the way, that Evelyn Glennie is completely deaf? By some God-given miracle, she has this ability in her to share with the world. You know, I, I saw a guy once that's kind of talking through things in life and getting a little help and a little wisdom from him. And he said, Alan, you know, I think a big part of what we do is each of us offers our own gift to the world. Not necessarily for our own gain, but God has given you a gift. Offer what you have to the world. So you have abilities that God has put, put in you. And you didn't buy them. They're, 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 not, they're, not, they're not yours. They're God's. You merely manage them. That's the point of this parable. What you have doesn't belong to you. You're a manager for the owner. And the owner is the creator, God himself. And then finally, God has given you money. So he's given you, he's given you time, 29,200 days. He's given you relationships, the people in your life. He's given you abilities like Evelyn, Evelyn Glennie, this remarkable percussion, drumming skill, whatever your ability is. And he's given you money. And what is money? Money just represents stuff, all the things of the world, all the things of the world. So you, you, your cows, your sheep, in this parable it would be, your car, your stocks, your pension fund, it, it's, it's all God's. He made it all. Your house, he made it all. But God is a gracious God and he's letting you take care of it while you're alive. During your 29,200 days, you get to manage your money your stuff, your possessions, your wealth. You get to use it and invest it and produce a return for God. But when your 29,200 days run out, as one of my friends says, it all goes back in the box. Somebody else is going to be in charge of it. <coughs> Somebody else is going to be in charge of the care of it. So in the meantime, they belong to God and you get to manage it. Later, when you and I are gone, somebody else will be managing that same stuff. I mean, it's a pretty good deal. You get to take care of it for God while you're here. So as you think about it, God has invested a, a, a pretty fair amount in you, hasn't he? And so there's three ways to respond. The first way is through fraud. And that's to say, you know what? One servant got $750,000. One servant got $1.5 million. One got $3.75 million. There's three different ways to respond. The first one, God expects a return on his time, his relationships, his abilities, and his money that he's allowing you to take care of, to, to manage. And the first one is fraud. And that's what, what's fraud? Fraud would be to say, you know what? I'm just going to use this however I want. I'm going to use my time, and I'm going to use my abilities, and I'm going to use my money, and I'm going to use these relationships for what I want. I'm going to pretend like they belong to me. And that's where the culture comes in. The culture tells you that it's your life. You should get to decide everything about your life. It's your money. You should get to do whatever you want with your money. It's your time. You should get to do whatever you want with your time. No, my life is, is actually God's. It belongs to God. I'm really managing these 29,200 days if I get to live to be 80. hope I do. I'm merely managing the money that I have for God. It's not mine. Still going to be here long after I'm gone. Somebody else is going to be in charge of it. God's just going to move it to somebody else's game. All goes back in the box when I die, and he puts it down on somebody else's monopoly board. So fraud is to pretend that it, it belongs to me, like the guy that was the chief financial officer of a chemical company I read about a few years ago. And he hosted the big um, company Christmas party at his house, and it was this marvelous new house on a mountain. He built this extravagant house, and it was filled with, with, with uh, great jewelry and fine china and draperies and imported furniture. And the owner of the business came to the Christmas party and started looking around. He goes, there is no way on God's green earth that this guy could build this house and furnish it like this on what I'm paying him to be the financial officer of my company. And so he went and he got an accounting firm and he got a forensics firm and they began to do a little digging and investigating. And they realized it wasn't the financial officer's money. It was the company's money. He was embezzling it. He was fraudulently pretending that the money he was supposed to manage was his own. So the first way to respond to what God has invested in you in your time and your relationships and your abilities and your money is to go through life sort of dumbstruck thinking, hey, it kind of all belongs to me. I'm just, I got this great skill being able to play the guitar and sing is my, my gift. I, I got all this money. 
belongs to me. I'm just going to do whatever I want. I'm going to spend it on me. No, nah, that would be called fraud. The second way to respond, the second way to respond is with laziness and fear, like the third servant, right? Remember the third servant, he gets the one talent, he gets the $750,000 and he's terrified. You know, if I lose some of this, the master's going to be really, really, really upset with me. So I'm going to just bury it in the ground. And so some of us, you know, we have these abilities and we choose not to use them because we're, you know, what if I fail? What if other people make fun of me? What if people don't like what I do? Or we have money and we're scared to give it away because, you know, I got I to hoard it and I got to keep it all for myself. Because what if I run out? I don't care if other people need it. I got I to gotta hang on to it for myself. And we have all these days and we go, yeah, I'll get around and doing it tomorrow. I know God wants me to kind of do this. I know God wants me to, to help this at the parish. And I know God really would like me to spend a little more time in prayer. And I, I know God would really hope that I might participate in the build on a Habitat for Humanity House. I'll get around to that maybe next year. And so we just lazily do nothing. We bury our time. We bury our relationships. We bury our abilities. We bury our money in the ground. Pretending like, I better not do anything because what happens if it doesn't go well? So we're lazy and we're fearful and we do nothing. And then the third, well, actually before, let me take you to a couple other places in scripture, because what happens to, the, to, that, to that third servant? You know, he's, Jesus says that the master says, take him, cast him outside where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And this is something in the gospel of Matthew that you will see all the time. When you're reading the gospel of Matthew, weeping and gnashing of teeth is sort of his favorite way, his preferred way to describe the agony of being separated from God and being on the outs with God. Let me give you a couple, a couple of examples in chapter 13. The son of man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom, all causes of sin and all evildoers and throw them into the furnace of fire. Their men will weep and gnash their teeth. And the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. And then later in chapter 13, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net, which was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into vessels, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. Watch this. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire. Their men will weep and gnash their teeth. All right, so the reason I show you that is because remember at the end here, uh, that's what happens to the to the to the servant who doesn't look in verse thirty. Cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. Their men will weep and gnash their teeth. Notice what the good servants got. The good servants got. Um, whoop, go back one more. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So you see what's happening is. The good servants are welcomed into the joy of the master. Well done. Get it. They get praise and they get welcome. They get celebrated. The lazy servant, the fearful servant, gets thrown into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there's three ways to respond. One is fraud. Two is with laziness. And on that theme of weeping and gnashing of teeth, one more marvelous place in scripture I want you to know about, Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light rises in the darkness for the upright. The Lord is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice, for the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of evil tidings. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. Its righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked man comes to naught. Right. So in Psalm 112, it reminds us that there's really kind of two paths. There's the path of being a, a, a good and noble person, an upright person who uses our wealth, who uses our friendships, who uses our time to give freely, to share generously, to be kind and to be hospitable, to be upright and not to not to not to uh, abuse people or to fraudulently treat people. And then there's the other. The wicked man does the opposite and treats people with dishonesty and with anger, and ends in the gnashing of teeth. And then so finally, there's the third way to respond. 
which is to generate a return. And that's what Jesus's parable is about, to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, to know that you have indeed distributed freely, given to the poor, that your righteousness will endure forever, that your horn will be exalted in honor, because you have done, as Psalm 112 said, you're one who fears the Lord, who delights in his commandments. Wealth and riches are in your house. Your righteousness will endure forever. Light rises in the darkness for you. It is well with you because you deal generously and lend. You conduct your affairs with justice. You won't be moved. You'll be remembered forever. You won't be afraid of evil because your heart is firm. Your heart is steady. You'll be generating return because you have distributed freely, given to the poor, and your righteousness will endure forever. That's the third way to respond. With generosity, with hospitality, with kindness, with peace, with friendship, and with love. So the point of this crazy story that Jesus tells, the point of this crazy story is that God invests in you and he expects a return. Now, at first blush, that kind of makes sense, but this story kind of raises the stakes, doesn't it? Because Jesus tells this crazy story to kind of wake us up and say, you really are not here just for yourself. You're here for God. Your life belongs to him. In fact, all of your friendships, all of your time, all of your money, and all of your abilities are God's. And when you die, those will go away, and God will evaluate your life based on how you have used those. God invests in you, and he expects a return. Wow, that's a crazy story, man. <laughs> that's a wake-up call, isn't it? It really, is, it really is like the smelling salts. It really, really is. And so I ask you the questions, if you're watching... Um, by yourself and you're keeping a journal to take some notes and to, and to keep up as you do with each of my Bible studies so that you kind of reflect on scripture. Or if you're watching as a small group, either in your home or at a parish, two discussion questions for you this week as you process and evaluate this crazy story of Jesus. Number one, name one way God has invested in you with time, relationships, money, and ability. Be honest with yourself. In each, in each of those four areas, name one way God has particularly invested in you. Be very clear on what you're managing for God. And then secondly, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Who would testify on your behalf? It's a great question because that's a great way to, to evaluate, am I really using my time? Am I really using my relationships? Am I really using my ability? And am I really using my money for God or am I merely using them for me? Would other people be able to say, yeah, there's, there's a lot of evidence that she's, a, that she's a Christian. Yeah, boy, I tell you what, here's what she does with her time. Here's how she uses her relationships. And who would testify on your behalf? Would there be people that say, yeah, my life has been dramatically different because she gave me some money when I was in need. My life has been dramatically different because she befriended me and really, and, and really helped me out. If you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And who would testify on your behalf? Crazy story number three. Process it, digest it, absorb it. As we pray together, uh, I pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we love you. Thank you for this wake-up call that reminds us that nothing we have belongs to us. Everything we have, our time, our relationships, our ability, and our money belongs to you, and we are merely managing it while we're here. Help us to use it wisely, generously, and lovingly, that we might bring glory to you and bring a little bit less suffering into the world and a lot more love. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Remember, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it.